Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about DNA structure, epigenetics, and imprinting. So why is this relevant? Well, epigenetics is a favorite of the USMLE Step 1 because it gives them the opportunity to test you on another genetic mechanism responsible for various human diseases. Lastly, having a basic understanding of the structure of DNA and RNA will help you become familiar with the terminology of the exam questions. It will also help you understand other commonly tested basic science topics. So let's start with the basic structure of DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA are nucleic acid polymers made up of nucleotide monomers. As we previously mentioned in our Essential Molecules video, there are five different kinds of nucleotides found in the human body which vary based on the nit nitrogenous base element. Nucleotides are made up of three basic molecules, a ribose, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. DNA and RNA share many similarities, but they differ in the structure of their respective ribose molecules and in the nitrogenous bases they use. The ribose in RNA has one more oxygen atom than the ribose found in DNA. Also, RNA nucleotides do not contain thymine. They contain uracil instead. The nitrogenous bases which make up DNA and RNA are grouped into two types, pyrimidines and purines, based on what type of ring structure they have. So here I have highlighted the basic structure of a nucleotide. There's a, our phosphate group is right here, our ribose sugar, and our nitrogenous base. A nitrogenous base is a special type of molecule which contains a ring structure with many nitrogen atoms, as we can see them right here. This is an RNA structure. It's missing its phosphate group but we can still highlight the ribose and the nitrogenous base. Another important difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA has an oxygen and a hydrogen pair of atoms right here. If we look at our DNA molecule, that is absent. That is why DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. The deoxy means that it is not oxygenated, it lacks an oxygen atom. The nitrogenous bases which make up DNA and RNA are grouped into two types, pyrimidines and purines based on what type of ring structure they have. Purines have a two ring structure and pyrimidines have a single ring structure. For example, there are two purines that are relevant, adenine and guanine, and you can see that they all have two rings with lots of nitrogen atoms. The pyrimidines on the other hand such as cytosine, thymine, and uracil have a single ring structure. That ring structure, however, still has various nitrogen atoms. This will become more relevant when we talk about DNA mutations and DNA repair mechanisms. So in summary, DNA is always double-stranded and RNA is single-stranded. DNA contains deoxyribose sugars, which basically means a ribose sugar without an oxygen atom, while RNA contains traditional ribose sugars. DNA uses thymine nucleotides and RNA uses uracil nucleotides. DNA, owing to its double-stranded nature and lack of oxygen atom, is more stable than RNA. It's important to remember that RNA makes up other important biomolecules such as mRNA and tRNA. Now that we have a basic understanding of the structure of DNA, next we will discuss the organization of DNA within cells. DNA is normally stored in the nucleus of cells. Humans contain 46 linear chromosomes, which means that inside every human cell there are a total of 46 strands of double-stranded DNA. Given that human DNA is made up of billions of nucleotides, it must be organized in a way that cells can easily manage it. This is accomplished by specialized proteins called histones. Histones are small proteins which function to organize DNA so it won't tangle on itself and break. Histones also function to regulate gene expression by influencing how easily transcription enzymes such as RNA polymerase can access DNA. In this illustration you will see a simplification of chromatin structure. You can probably find a better image of this on the internet. However, for the purpose of this video, this will suffice. Essentially, histones are small round circular proteins which DNA wraps around. Histones organize themselves in spiral configurations called nucleosomes. As we will soon discuss in the next few slides, histones can adjust how tight the DNA is kept and this can influence how often the genes in the DNA are transcribed by DNA polymerase to make proteins. 
So if we analyze this image, we can see that we have our double-stranded DNA molecule. That double-stranded DNA molecule wraps around a group of histones. This is called a nucleosome. And then you have multiple nucleosomes, which contain histone molecules. And that forms other structures, which eventually end up as part of the chromosome. Now I want to introduce you to the topic of epigenetics. As we discussed in our previous video, regulation of gene expression is performed in large part by special proteins called transcription factors which can bind certain specialized DNA sequences. By binding to these special DNA sequences, these proteins can influence how much or how little a certain gene is transcribed. However, there is another mechanism which can, off which can influence how much DNA is transcribed or expressed. This second mechanism is unique in that it does not rely on sequences on DNA. This is essentially what epigenetics is. Epigenetics are any mechanism which can influence DNA expression without the use of specialized DNA sequences. There are four types of epigenetic mechanisms that you must be familiar with. These are DNA methylations, histone acetylation, X chromosome inactivation, and genetic imprinting. Let's start with the most important of these mechanisms, DNA methylation. As we previously discussed, cytosine is one of the five nucleotides found in nucleic acids. However, cytosine is unique in that it can be modified to accept a methyl group in order to become methylcytosine. DNA which contains high concentrations of methylcytosine will not be transcribed by RNA polymerases. This effectively acts to suppress transcription without actually changing the DNA sequence. Instead, there are specialized enzymes which can either methylate or demethylate DNA. This mechanism is extremely important in genetic imprinting and X chromosome inactivation. Next, we will introduce another epigenetic mechanism, histone acetylation. Just like how the addition of a methyl group to DNA can influence transcription, the addition of an acetyl group to a histone protein can increase transcription. This occurs because the acetyl groups make the DNA structure less tight. This allows RNA polymerase to bind and start the process of transcription. There are essentially two types of chromatin which differ by how tight or condensed the DNA is. Heterochromatin refers to chromatin which is heavily methylated and therefore transcriptionally inactive. Euchromatin on the other hand refers to chromatin which is more relaxed because it has high levels of histone acetylation and therefore is transcriptionally active. Now I will introduce you to the topic of X chromosome inactivation. Humans have a total of 23 different chromosomes and two copies of each of these chromosomes for a total of 46. For example, we all have two copies of chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, all the way up to chromosome 22. The exception to this are the sex chromosomes in males. Males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. In humans, both copies of each chromosome are expressed at the same time, except X chromosomes. Unlike chromosomes 1 through 22, we only need one functional copy of chromosome X. For example, we all need two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3 working and being expressed at the same time. That's just how much we need. However, we do not need two copies of chromosome X. We only need one copy of chromosome X being transcribed and expressed. Since males only have one X chromosome, this is not a problem. However, females have two copies of chromosome X. Therefore, one of the X chromosomes must be deactivated. During female embryogenesis, one of these X chromosomes is randomly inactivated through heavy methylation of the entire chromosome. Since now only one of the X chromosomes can be transcribed, this process functionally eliminates a chrom an X chromosome. The inactivated chromosome then becomes a bar body, which is a heavily condensed chromosome. So let's take, for example, these two X chromosomes. Let's say that they belong to a cell. During embryogenesis, one of these X chromosomes will randomly be inactivated. Let's say that the blue chromosome becomes inactivated. It is then heavily methylated, and effectively, it does not work. You're left with only one functioning X chromosome, which is all you need. Because one of the chromosomes has been inactivated, that is why it's called X chromosome inactivation. Now let's talk about imprinting. 
As we mentioned before, humans have 23 different chromosomes and two copies of each for a total of 46 chromosomes, again with the exception of the sex chromosomes. We inherit one chromosome from each parent. Normally each of these chromosomes is expressed simultaneously. So for example, the gene for the protein insulin is encoded in chromosome 11. This means that we have two copies of this gene since we have two copies of chromosome 11 which are expressed at the same time, usually. In theory, we could lose one copy of the insulin gene on one chromosome, let's say for example because of a mutation, and we can still be able to make insulin since we have another copy of this gene on the other chromosome. Just like regular genes, we also have two copies of imprinted genes, one on each chromosome. However, unlike regular unimprinted genes, we only use one copy of the imprinted gene on only one chromosome. The chromosome picked to be used depends on which parent it came from. So for example, Prader-Willi syndrome occurs due to a mutation in a gene called NDN which is located in the paternal copy of chromosome 15. While everyone has two copies of the NDN gene, one from their mother and one from their father, they only use the paternal copy because the maternal copy is methylated during meiosis. So for example, here you can see the genotype or genes of a person and their parent. As you can see, this person has two copies of chromosome 15, one copy from each parent. Each chromosome 15 has one copy of the NDN gene. So for example, here we have the paternal copy of chromosome 15 and here we have the maternal copy of chromosome 15. They all have the same genes. However, the NDN gene in the maternal copy of chromosome 15 has been methylated and therefore deactivated. This typically occurs during spermatogenesis or oogenesis. We can represent the methylated gene on the maternal chromosome 15 by the darker shade of green. The consequence of this is that if for any reason a mutation occurs in the paternal copy of the NDN gene or the gene is lost, there will not be any expression of this gene even though the patient technically has a functional copy of the NDN gene on the maternal copy of chromosome 15. This copy will not be expressed because it is methylated. So for example, let's say that this is a regular patient. If during development there is a mutation which knocks out the paternal copy of the NDN gene on chromosome 15, then this person will not have the products of this gene and this person will have Prader-Willi syndrome. If, let's say, that the opposite were to happen and we were to lose the maternal copy of the NDN gene on the maternal chromosome 15, well, this would not have any consequences because the maternal copy of the NDN gene is normally not expressed. This would be a healthy subject. I will also take this opportunity to introduce you to another genetic mechanism commonly encountered in the USMLE step one that is uniparental diasomy. Normally we receive one copy of each chromosome from each parent. However, occasionally errors can occur during meiosis and gametogenesis which result in part of a chromosome being lost. Therefore, during conception, part of the DNA from a chromosome will not be available. What sometimes happens is that this missing DNA from one parent is filled in by DNA from the other parent's chromosome in such a way that a person may only receive certain genes from one parent. So for example, let's say that you have a sperm cell which has a copy of chromosome 15, which if you remember is the chromosome that contains the NDN gene in Prader-Willi. Now let's say that this sperm cell meets an egg cell that has its own copy of chromosome 15. Normally these would join up and you would get a zygote that has two copies of chromosome 15. However, let's imagine for a second that during spermatogenesis there was an error that produced a broken chromosome 15 in such a way that the chromosome is missing part of its structure. Well, what will happen is that you will get a zygote that has that damaged chromosome 15 and then it has the intact and undamaged chromosome 15 from the mother. So it'll look something like this. So what can sometimes happen is 
that the maternal chromosome 15 will be used as a template to make or fix the paternal chromosome 15. So the gaps will be filled in from the DNA from the maternal copy of chromosome 15. Now normally this is not an issue. However, if the part of the chromosome 15 that was filled in by the maternal DNA contains the NDN gene as in the Prader-Willi gene, then effectively you will get two copies of the NDN gene that are both from the maternal chromosome. And this is a problem because maternal NDN genes are not expressed because they are methylated. So even though this person has two chromosome 15s, they do not have a functional copy of the NDN gene and they will express the Prader-Willi phenotype. This can also become a problem in autosomal recessive disorders. So for example, in order to have an autosomal recessive disorders, you need two copies of a mutated gene. So let's say, however, that on this chromosome 15, there is one copy of a mutated gene. That is, we're going to mark it by this X right here. Okay. Normally, you would have a paternal chromosome 15 that would have a functional copy of that gene and everything is okay because you still have protein from that gene. However, if this same process happens, then when this DNA is copied to fill in the gaps, you will also copy the mutated gene. So this person all of a sudden has two copies of the mutated gene and would express an autosomal recessive disease, such as cystic fibrosis, for example. While this is a bit of an oversimplification, this will help you conceptualize how uniparental disomy works and how it can be applied to exam questions. So in summary, gene expression is regulated by both epigenetic and non-epigenetic mechanisms. Changes in the chemical structure of DNA or histones can influence gene expression by making DNA either tight or relaxed. Since this does not involve any specific DNA sequence, it is an example of epigenetics. The consequences of these mechanisms are the principle behind genetic phenomena such as X inactivation and imprinting. So that's all for this lecture. Thank you for watching and see you in the next lecture.